Our dear Lord God, we thank you so much for this wonderful day that you've given to us, Lord. Um, we can never have enough thanks, we can never have enough praise, we can never have enough gratitude, Lord, to you for the very life and breath that you give us and that you sustain within us. And so we ask for a blessing upon this day, Lord, as we are here to give praise and glory and honor uh, back to you, Lord, because it is well deserved. And uh, Lord, we just ask for a blessing upon each and every person here and for those traveling in, Lord. In the wonderful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. And everyone said, Amen. You may be seated. Get our Bibles ready. We're going to be allowing our fingers to do the walking through the holy pages this morning. And uh, so have that Bible ready, either in hard copy or on your device. And we'll get up and rolling both, says Miguel. He's all in. And I want to compliment you as a church. Uh, as you know, uh, we're on the subject of prophecy. And it's been nice that people have been interacting with me. Um, after the messages on Sunday, asking questions and having discussion about it. And that's the way it should be. The church should be a learning institution, right? Yeah. And we should all come together and seek to study to show ourselves approved. A workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, rightly yeah. dividing. And so keep that coming. And please understand that when we delve into the matter of prophecy, it's so sublime, uh, nobody has all the answers. And uh, I would never assume myself to be 100% correct on everything. It's just so wide and so deep. Um, it's, it takes forever even to get a message together because you're thinking through so many different things. But that being said, though, in 1988, a booklet was published titled, 88 Reasons Why the Rapture Will Be in 1988. It was written by a NASA engineer, Edgar Wisenant, and it sold over 4 million copies. 300,000 copies were sent free to pastors in America. Well, he claimed the rapture would take place between September 11th through 13th of that year, which was the Jewish calendar, Rosh Hashanah, their new year. That's when he claimed it would happen. And it didn't happen. And it's a good thing it didn't because my daughter was born that year in November. And I wouldn't have had it if his predictions came true, right? When it didn't happen, this engineer recalculated and then determined, oh, it's, it's going to happen not in September, but in October. <laughs> and he was disappointed again. So he went back to work and produced another booklet. This one was titled, The Final Shout, Rapture Report 1989, which offered 89 reasons why the rapture would occur in 1989. He died in 2001 without seeing the rapture happen. Now he is one of the dead, which will rise first when it does happen. Amen? <laughs> but to be sure, the Bible does certainly say that there will be a rapture of believers. That is as clear as black ink on white paper in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. Here Paul writes, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Including Edgar Wisenat. Then, verse 17, We which are alive and remain shall be caught up together. And that's where the word rapture comes from. The word rapture indicates this language, caught up. Then we which are alive, and the word rapture is not in the Bible. It connotates this idea of being caught up. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And these clouds are not your ordinary cumulus clouds. 
These clouds are representative of the presence and glory of God. Shekinah glory clouds, all right? So get that in your mind. Amen. They're not going to be necessarily white and puffy. So the rapture will happen. Amen? Amen? But unfortunately, there is a lot of bad teaching and confusion about the timing of it as we've illustrated. And I can understand Christians get excited about the idea of it. Yes. And it's very easy to get ahead of your skis when you think about something as glorious as being caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Great air rescue, right? I mean, I have to tell you, there's times that I put my sneakers on and practice my rapture jump. It's, it's just exciting stuff. It's hard to sit still when you think about the idea uh, that Paul gives us in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. But what I want to assert to you this morning is the best way to understand the rapture is to rely more on the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ about it than the teaching of men. This is, this is the best thing we can do for ourselves to get as close as to right as we possibly can be as mere mortal humans trying to understand God's plan in the end of the age. But I would really urge you to set aside everything you've learned of men and just focus completely on what the Lord Jesus Christ teaches about this. And you know we're in the book of Revelation because the seven seals in Revelation chapter 6 have relevancy concerning the rapture, it is extremely insightful to compare it, chapter 6, with Jesus' teaching in what we call the Olivet Discourse. The reason it's called the Olivet Discourse is Jesus taught this on the Mount of Olives to his disciples. So that's what we want to do today, is we want to take a little detour, and we want to consider, before we get into Revelation chapter 6 and really study the seals, we want to consider Jesus' teaching uh, on the Olivet, in, uh, in the Olivet Discourse, because it relates so much to what we'll be dealing with concerning this this. this the seals. Now we left off in Revelation chapter 5 with the glorified Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, taking the scroll with seven seals from the hand of God the Father. Um, let's go to Revelation chapter 5 just to review that. Because everything from this point launches from what John saw here in Revelation chapter 5. So let's just look at verses 1 through 7 to refresh our memory. John says, And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne, the right hand of him on the throne is God the Father, a book or a scroll written within and on the backside sealed with how many seals? <laughs> and I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much. John was wailing because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed, has been victorious, to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. Amen. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. This is the Lord Jesus. In verse 7, let's read it out loud together. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. Amen. So it is up to the Lord Jesus in his sovereignty to take the scroll and to open the seals. That is what he and he alone 
is going to do. So remember last week, we came to the conclusion that the scroll sealed with seven seals is the title deed of planet Earth. And the seals must be broken before the scroll can be opened and the ultimate redemption of man and the earth can be achieved. That's why John was so intent that, you know, someone's got to be able to break these seals. Because if the scroll never gets open, what is at stake for all of us? What is at stake is the ultimate redemption of man and the earth cannot be achieved. Those seals have to be broken so the content of the title deed can be executed. Amen? Amen. Now, getting back to the Olivet Discourse, Matthew chapter 24, it's extremely insightful to find out that the six seals of Revelation chapter 6 precisely parallel the Lord's teaching in His Olivet Discourse. I mean, this is seminal in our understanding of prophecy is finally coming to the observation that what Jesus talks about in Matthew 24, fortunately, is parallel with the six seals revealed in Revelation chapter 6. Amen. This just gives us so much clarity and understanding. And so that's why we start there. But one more catch. We don't even start there yet. Hold on. We'll get there. But what we see in the Olivet Discourse, by the teaching of Jesus, is the basis for end-time prophecy comes from the book of Daniel, chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. So let's turn there if we can. Daniel, chapter 9. And we're just going to do a quick reading and an overview of this because, again, we're going to see in Matthew 24 that Jesus bases what he's teaching on the foundation of Daniel chapter 9 and what we see in verses 24 through 27. So let's look at Daniel 9, 24. It says, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people, Israel, and upon thy holy city, which is what? Jerusalem, to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. So he's talking about 70 weeks and the context causes us to understand that he's talking about 70 weeks of years. So, we have weeks of days. How many days are in our week? Four. Seven, right? So if we're talking about weeks of years, if seven days make up a week, a normal week, if we're talking about weeks of years, how many years make up one week of years? Seven. Seven. So there's 70 weeks in this time frame. And 7 times 7 equals 490 years total. So we're talking about a period of 490 years. And it all affects, look at verse 24, it all affects thy people, Israel, and thy holy city, which is what? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. So this is so key. We need to understand that Jerusalem and the nation of Israel is God's time clock regarding prophecy. Ultimately, what God does is related to His holy people and the holy city, Jerusalem. And concerning these people, there is something in the formula that requires 490 years concerning the city and these people. Let's read on in verse 25. Now therefore, no, excuse me, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. 
So what we're seeing is up to the time that Jesus was crucified, all but one week happened. So we're talking about 483 years have transpired. 69 weeks are finished. Again, that all happened when Jesus the Messiah was crucified. But what caused Jesus to be crucified? The rejection of God's people, the nation of Israel. And what happened as a result of him uh, being rejected? In 70 AD, Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed. Right? So at that point, 69 weeks are over, but the nation of Israel is dispersed. And so there's one more week that hasn't been fulfilled because they really don't exist as a nation anymore. And that's where uh, this takes us. And after three, verse 26, and after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with a flood unto the end of the war. Desolations are determined. And here comes the commentary on the final seven years of human history. Mm. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. A week of years is how many years? Seven. Okay, so there's your 70th week. He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, three and a half years into it, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease in Jerusalem, in the temple. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate. Even until the what? The consummation and the end of human history and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. God takes over. So there's one more week outstanding and it could not happen until Israel became a nation again. When did Israel become a nation again? May 15, 1948. So now... We who are alive since Israel became a nation in 1948, we are looking for that final seven years, the 70th week. In Tim Miguel. See. Amen. See. Now, concerning verse 27, this is the last thing I'm going to say before we go to Matthew 24. Isn't this stuff amazing, though? Mm -hmm. You see why I put my sneakers on and practice my rapture jump? I mean, this stuff is just too amazing. That we're alive to see this happen. Anybody who was alive, before, who was alive and died before 1948, couldn't see this happen. No. This Israel must become a nation. All of this is tied to one city, Jerusalem, and one people. Israel. Israel. What I want us to see, though, is the last seven years begins, look at verse 27, with the confirmation of a treaty. Look what it says here. And he shall confirm the covenant, the treaty, with many for seven years. So, he says, this world leader that confirms, strengthens this treaty. But I want us to see, a lot of times people think that this is a covenant made exclusively, exclusively with Israel. It doesn't say that. He's going to make the treaty with what? Many. He doesn't say with thy people, like he set up in verse, verse number 24. He says he's going to make this treaty with many. So we just have to have an open mind to this. It may be a treaty that doesn't exclusively involve Israel. It could be a treaty that involves other countries, right? Amen. Because it says many. And that's a very loose word. It's not thy people. Are you hearing that, Danny Bigelow? <laughs> All right? So, it's confirmed with many. So now, let's go to Matthew 24 because I said that Matthew 24 and the book of Revelation, chapter 6, both address 
this final seven year period. That's what Matthew 24 is all about, the 70th week. And guess what? The book of Revelation is about one week of years, the 70th week. Amen. And most of the content in the book of Revelation deals with the last three and a half years. The last three and a half years, okay? So this really gets us, you know, uh, anchored to some basic understanding that simplifies things going forward. So Matthew 24, let's look at verses 1 through 3. That Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. So they're in Jerusalem, and he's with the people of Israel. And Jesus said unto them, See not all these things, the buildings? Verily I say unto you, the temple? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And he was predicting that the judgment of God for, uh, for Israel rejecting their Messiah would be the temple would be destroyed, Jerusalem would be destroyed, and what year did that happen? 70 AD. So they were blown away. Wow, the temple's going to be destroyed? You're dealing with prophecy here. You're dealing with the end of the world. So, they're curious. Verse number 3. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? What are these things? The destruction of the temple. And because that's going to be so cataclysmic, we're thinking you're talking about the end of the age. And so their next question is, and what shall be the what? The sign. sign of thy coming and of the end of the world, i.e. age. So they sort of extend this now. If the temple is going to be destroyed, the Messiah is going to have to come back and rescue us. So when is all this going to happen? Uh, how will we know when it's going to happen? The two seem like they could mesh together and, and be very confusing. Uh, how are we going to know? And so they ask for a sign. They want to have signals. Signals to know and understand when this is going to happen. All right? So right away, Jesus, we see, is going to entertain that question. Right away, we will know that Jesus says there are signals we can look for that tell us the consummation of the age is coming. We don't have to just like be totally checked out with any evidence of when it might happen. There will be these signs, these signals. Now we already talked about one that we've seen already, and that was May 15, 1948. What signal happened? Israel was a nation. Israel became a nation again. So now the 70th week is in play. We know we are living in a time that conceivably we could see the last seven years of human history, the 70th week of Daniel. So he's going to oblige them. He's going to oblige them with that question, what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the age? And he answers their question by identifying three events, three signals that must proceed his coming. The first signal is what he terms the beginning of sorrows. Now we see that in our English, the word sorrows. If we saw it in the Greek, what we would understand this to mean is the beginning of birth pains. The world is ready to be delivered. Like I told you before, this is the Jewish year 5782. The Jewish calendar year 5782 is alleged to mark when creation happened. This earth has been around a long time. Man has had plenty of times through government after government after government to rescue this planet. And every time he fails. And so, After Israel becomes a nation again, what we will see happening, and even leading up to them becoming a nation again, we will be witnessing what Jesus calls the beginning of sorrows. 
the beginning of birth pains, right? Yes. And here's the deal. What Jesus describes as the beginning of birth pains completely parallels the first four seals that we are going to see in Revelation chapter 6. So let's look at these birth pains, these beginning of sorrows that Jesus talks about. Let's look at verses 4 and 5 in Matthew 24. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall do what? Deceive many. All right? So there is a first indicator of the beginning of sorrows, that there will be false Christs. Keep your finger in Matthew, turn over to Revelation chapter 6, and see the parallel. Did I say Matthew 6? Yeah. You know what I mean. You know what I mean. I mean Revelation 6. Revelation 6. So what Jesus says about false Christs and deceptions completely matches up with what happens with the opening of the first seal. Look what he says. John. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. What does the rider of the white horse represent? He's wearing a crown. He's riding a white horse. He represents a false Christ, right? Some people reading this for the first time might think that it's describing Jesus because he's riding a white horse and a crown, wearing a crown. But he's going to conquer the world through deception. The rider of the white horse represents false Christs and deception that will plague the world. And that's exactly what Jesus said in verses 4 and 5. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. The rider on the white horse represents false Christs and worldwide deception. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now keep your finger in Revelation. Let's turn back to Matthew chapter 24, because what Jesus says in verses 6 and 7 match up with the second seal. These are birth pains. Not only false Christ, but look at verse 6, and you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must what? Come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. Now let's look at the second seal in Revelation chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. Revelation 6, 3 and 4, And when he had opened what seal? Second. The second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red. And power was given to him that sat thereon to take what from the earth? Peace. Peace. And that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. Do you see it, everybody? The red horse represents wars and rumors of wars. What did Jesus say would be one of the beginning of sorrows, the beginning of birth pains? In verse number 7 of Matthew 24, he said, Nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. That is the rider of the red horse. Amen. We've seen a white horse so far. False Christs. You've seen a red horse? War. War. What did Jesus say in the Olive Discourse? False Christs and war. You following me? Mm -hmm. Now let's go back to Matthew 24. And let's see another part of verse 7, which is parallel to the third <coughs> seal. 
He says, after kingdom rising against kingdom, there's a colon, which is a break of thought in the text, and a very big and. And there shall be what? Famines. Back to Revelation chapter 6, verses 5 and 6, we see the opening of the third seal, and it completely matches up with what Jesus is talking about in Matthew 24. Let's look at the third seal, verse number 5. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see, and behold, and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand, scales. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see that thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Now what is this language picturative of? Well, uh, a measure of wheat would cost a man at some point a, a penny, which is a denarius, a whole day of wages. Working a whole day for a measure of wheat indicates famine, does it not? What did Jesus say in verse number 7? And there shall be famines. The rider of the black horse represents famine, and I would add also, Danny Bigelow, perhaps worldwide inflation that is unsolvable. Has anybody heard anything about inflation nowadays? Yes. <laughs> Now, this is the Jewish calendar year 5782. Why are we still having inflation? How come man goose up economics all the time and has us begging for him to fix it for us so we don't have to pay $7 for a gallon of gas? Because that gets into our vacation funds, doesn't it? All right. So we're three seals down, and we say that the first four seals are akin to Jesus' identification of beginning of sorrows, beginning of birth pains. And so now we go to uh, the last part of verse number 7 of Matthew 24. He said there there would be wars, nation would rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. That was the red horse, and there shall be famines. That was the black horse and rider. And finally he says, and pestilences and earthquakes in various places. This is the fourth seal. Back to Revelation chapter 6, verse 7. And when he had opened the fourth, yeah, and when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse. Okay, this pale indicates greenish, sickly looking color. All right? So it is the pale horse. And his name that set on him was what? Death and hell. Was death, excuse me. And hell followed with him, and power was given unto him over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with beasts of the earth. So here we see the problem. The rider of the pale horse represents death and pestilence. Worldwide death. An unusual amount of death through circumstances that are unusual. An epidemic of death by unexplainable factors like pandemics yes. that they say came from a bat. <laughs> All right? But what did Jesus say here? There would be uh, death caused by beasts of the earth. So maybe that's their excuse. Blame it on the animals. Blame it on the bats. That's a nice excuse. It was the bat that gave us COVID-19. He did it. Alright? And so the fourth seal, Matthew 24, 
uh, matches up with pestilence and earthquakes and all kinds of phenomena that result in massive deaths, tragedies, crises. And Jesus ends in verse 8. Let's all read that out loud together. All these are the beginning of sorrows. And so that matches up with the first four seals. But now we go, remember there are three events that precede the Lord's coming that are signs, signals to you and me. And these here are the signals that Jesus says are the beginning of sorrows, the beginning of birth pains. The earth is pregnant, wanting to be delivered from the corruption that man has made. Yes, uh, it has to do with the fervor that we're seeing that the government is manufacturing with racism because nations here is the word where we get the word ethnicity. And so it's ethnicity against ethnicity. So we have a war going on right now, and it is the Russians versus the Ukraine. Ukrainians. Ethnicity against ethnicity war. Is that what you were kind of looking yeah. for? Thank you. Another man. Yes, manufacturing ethnic violence. And it's happening here in America, isn't it? Mm -hmm. People are edgy all the time. Edgy. Things are more racist now than they've ever been in my lifetime. And who did that? Who started that? People in high places. It's their mantra. It's their brainwashing technique. And so Andrew brings out a good point. Feel free to raise your hand. This is a learning institution. We're all talking about this. I'm getting texts. I'm getting emails. We're buzzing over the book of Revelation. So feel free, Brother Andrew. And First Lady, if I say something stupid, you raise your hand and correct me. First Lady's all in. She can't wait for me to say something stupid. You're my backup. You're a good help, too. Yes. I like you better over here than way over yonder. <laughs> Checks and balances. Where were we? Oh. <laughs> so the second signal will be what Jesus terms the great tribulation. Now follow his line of thought. If you start with birth pains, the birth pains would become harder and occur more rapidly. It'll all start happening so fast. Ladies, you know what I'm talking about. It'll all start happening so fast and be so intense. And that will lead up to the coming of the end of the age, the delivery. How many ladies know what I'm talking about? You start with birth pains, and that transitions to hard labor. And when hard labor comes, look out. As Pam's Lamaze coach, I was hapless at that point. There was nothing that I could do for her but say, give me an epidural in here. Epidural, epidural, now. <laughs> but it never came. All right. So let's look at verses 9 through 22 of Matthew 24. He said, all these are the beginning of sorrows. Verse 8, now a very pivotal point. Then... Transition, shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you? And you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake, even Canada. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall grow cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. This isn't talking about the forgiveness of sins. This is talking about being delivered from the great tribulation. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall what come? The end. The end come. Now remember we said that Jesus uh, is building his prophecy on Daniel 9. And here he brings up Daniel 9.27 that we read earlier in the message. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation 
spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place of the temple, whosoever readeth, let him understand. The great tribulation begins three and a half years into the seven, seven weeks of the 70th week. It happens three and a half years in when the Antichrist betrays Israel and appears in the temple and proclaims himself to be deity, which is not new. The Roman emperors did the same thing. This is just on a much grander, more heavy-handed scale because of technology and everything. He can collate 100% compliance or you're in trouble, that type of thing. But this is exactly what we saw in Daniel 9.27 that says, when will it happen? He says, in the midst of the week, right? You saw it, right? Didn't we read that? In the midst of the week, three and a half years in. So then you know, it's no longer beginning of sorrows, we in it. This is the great tribulation. Then let them then let, which be in Judea flee into the mountains, because of course this is the Antichrist is acting up in Israel, so you've got to get shelter from him. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house, neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. But, for, you know, having a child, imagine trying to run away when you're still um, feeding a baby, nursing a baby. How terrible. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter when it's cold and there's snow and you're having to flee into the wilderness, neither on the Sabbath day, because then you'll be breaking the Sabbath and you'll be breaking Jewish law. But here's the, the key verse, verse 21. Then shall be, here's the nomenclature, what? Tribulation. Great tribulation. What are the two events? Beginning of sorrows? What's the next signal before the Lord's coming? Great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Daniel 9, 26. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be delivered or saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. So there's still going to be seven years, but Jesus is going to shorten the great tribulation by bringing deliverance of the people out of it so that they all won't be annihilated and exterminated. There won't be another holocaust that will be supremely successful. So, we've got to match up the Great Tribulation with the Fifth Seal. And we can do that if you turn to Revelation again, chapter 6, and find verse number 9. And when he had opened what seal? The fifth seal. I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. They were martyred during this time of great tribulation. And so the tribulation will be cut short. It will last about 21 months, half of the last three and a half years. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Which leads us to the last thing that Jesus talks about that is a signal to us to know that Jesus is coming. Back to Matthew 24. And it involves the sixth seal. And we're calling this cosmic disturbance. How we know we're getting near to Jesus' second coming? Well, first of all, we're going to see birth pains. And that's the first four seals. We're going to see deception worldwide. We're going to see war worldwide. We're going to see famine and inflation, monetary issues, uh, breaking people. And then we're going to see all kinds of weird stuff like pestilence and earthquakes causing massive deaths. First four seals. After that comes great tribulation. Beginning of sorrows, great tribulation. At that time, the Antichrist is going to try and literally exterminate anybody on earth that believes the Word of God. 
Jewish or Christian. And he would be successful, but in the middle of that last three and a half weeks, after about 21 months in, there's going to be the last sign which tells us we're going home. Amen. And that is cosmic disturbances. Amen. Let's go to uh, Matthew chapter 24 and verse 29. Immediately after the what? Tribulation following the nomenclature. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. So we're talking about things up in space. And the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. We're talking about cosmic disturbances. We see that happen. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Amen. Over to Revelation in the sixth seal. Revelation chapter 6, verses 12 through 13. And I beheld when he had opened what seal? Six. The sixth seal. And lo, there was a great earthquake. And guess what? Cosmic disturbance. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair. And the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree passed her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. Isn't that just like what Jesus said? The sun shall be dark and the moon shall not give her light. The stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then, that's the sign, then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And that is the sixth seal. Cosmic disturbances. So, as we wrap up, can I have... Five to seven more minutes with you all? Yes. Would that be okay? Yes. I really want to finish this. Yes. If, if you can't take any more, just kindly get up and excuse yourself, and we'll see you next week. But well, wave to me as you go out the door. If you can't hang another seven minutes, say goodbye to me at least, because I won't be able to see you afterwards. When we compare Matthew 24 with Revelation 6, we find out the Bible teaches the second coming of Christ speaks of a coming and continual presence to accomplish a number of divine purposes. What are we talking about? The second coming includes three things. It will begin with the rapture. Look at Matthew 24, 31. He appears in the clouds, the Shekinah glory clouds, not the cumulus clouds. He appears coming uh, in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. It lights up the whole atmosphere. Nature's natural light is put out, the moon and the stars and the sun. It becomes completely black, blackened. So in the cosmic uh, space, you can see the glory of God. And at that time, verse 31, the rapture, and he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together what is elect from the four winds, from the one end of heaven to the other. All of God's elect will be caught up to meet him in the clouds. Amen. What's that sound like to you? The rapture. And so, just like his first coming, we talk about Jesus' first coming. It was a continual presence of Jesus for 33 years. It was his birth. It was his earthly ministry. It was his death. All of that, we combine his continual presence. We say that was his what coming? First, First coming. Um, when we talk about Jesus' second coming, there's only one second coming, just like there was only one first coming, but the second coming uh, incorporates his continuous presence to accomplish three things. His second coming will include the rapture of the church, then it will be followed by the day of the Lord, wrath, 
Once we're taken out, God's wrath begins, and then the Lord's literal return to the earth to set up the kingdom. So rapture, judgment, and then his kingdom will come. That's all in his second coming. Hey, where's my other page of notes? Ooh, ooh. Maybe I'm going to have to quit with this. Um, I might need 10 minutes of you. I think I've got to go find my other page of notes. But let me do this while I'm going to fetch them. Concerning after the rapture, the day of the Lord wrath, turn to Revelation 6, 14 through 17. This talks about that. Revelation 6, 14 through 17. Just like Jesus said, And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places, and the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man hid themselves in the, in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath. See, there's the first mention of wrath. Now the wrath of God is happening because his elect have been rescued. And so now the wrath of God and the wrath of the Lamb is taking place. This is the day of the Lord, the second component of God's second coming. For the great day of his wrath, again, for the second time we see wrath, is after we are gone, then wrath. Then for the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? So there you have the parallel. And the language matches up to an incredible degree with the Olivet Discourse in Revelation chapter 6. I won't get my notes. We've had enough. But let's go ahead and stand and turn to page 385. The application I want to make to you today is the Christian approach to prophecy has been a little bit upside down. Let me grab a swallow of water and I'll tell you what I mean as you turn to 385. Evangelical Christian prophetical teaching has always been to somehow, some way, create escape for Christians. I want you to know that in the book of Revelation, the word escape is never found. But there's another word that applies to you and me that is found eight times, and the rewards are out of this world. The word overcome. We have been, I think, dealt a bad hand because so much of prophecy we've been focusing on escape. When the book of Revelation never talks like that, the book of Revelation talks about you and me being overcomers. Amen. And by being overcomers, God rewards us with rewards that we would not trade for anything, including escape. And this is the reality in which we live. As I'm teaching the book of Revelation, I am in a surreal moment of talking to my daughter while I'm teaching this stuff and realizing that she works in a place where the very law makes it very risky for her to proclaim the word of God. And yet now that she's been there over a year and has developed the trust of some precious women. This is exactly where she goes to the Word of God. And I get goosebumps when I say goodbye to her 
Because I realize that Pam and I, as, as a mom and dad, we see that our daughter is in a place now that demands risk. And all it would take is someone saying the wrong thing to a wrong person. Oh, no. And it could be very bad for my daughter. No, no. I could be talking to her for the last time, and she realizes that. No. But there's no other way it can happen. There's no other alternative for her but risk. That's the way it's turning for all of us. We don't have to go to where my daughter is to see that the Word of God is against the law. You can take a short trip to Canada and see pastors incarcerated right now for the Word of God. No. Guess what? Canada is awfully close to your country. Good. And so I want you to sing this song and I want you to begin to change your mind you're not looking for escape as a child of God. You are looking to be an overcomer. Amen. Because the very word witness, we say we want to be a witness for Jesus. The very word witness is from the Greek word martus, where we get our word martyr. And so if you're really going to be a witness for Jesus Christ, listen, it's going to cost you something. Even in America. Yeah. There's no way you can truly be a witness if you are not incurring a cost for being a witness, then that means you're a witness light. And so, as we go forward, we won't next week because of the Easter holiday, but the following week, the 24th, as we go forward to the six seals of Revelation chapter 6, I want us to start having this mindset, and I want this to be your prayer. Turn to page 385. This is our prayer responding to the Word of God today. We're going to sing the first verse in the chorus. Then we're going to sing verse 3 and verse 4 and then the chorus. First verse, chorus, verses 2 and 3, uh, excuse me, verses 3 and 4, and then chorus. So only a chorus at the first and the last. Let's stand. This is your prayer. By the way, you did a great job again. We had so much to cover. You guys are the best church in the world. <laughs> I'm just teasing. Josh, edit that on the tape, please. <laughs> Staining. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling, take thy cross and follow, follow me. Chorus, where he leads me I will follow, where he leads me I will follow, where he
raised, how many of you have made this song your prayer today and you Amen. intend on being true to your prayer? That's beautiful. Let me pray for you. Our Father in heaven and precious Lamb of glory, Lord Jesus, we know that this is your church. You are the head of the church. And you spoke to me and you said, teach your flock the book of Revelation. And Lord, we praise you for your direction because we are being blessed being blessed by your word, Lord, and by the revelation of John. And Lord, I ask that you look upon every hand that was raised, and that you heard with much delight every voice that sang this song and made it the prayer of their lives. And Lord, for them, look upon them right now, Lamb of glory. Look upon them, and I pray that you give them grace and glory, and that you go with them all the way this coming week, and all the way into the rapture. Lord, be with this church. Glorify yourself through this church in the last days. You are worthy, and we are so happy to be here for you to proclaim your glorious name. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Well, we're going to get you ready for uh, Easter week with a brand new song.